This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Audible. Go to audible.com slash yesterworld or text yesterworld to 500-500 for a free 30-day trial and also receive your first audiobook and two Audible originals for absolutely free. What a perfect day. The sun is shining, the sky is blue, and I have one of my favorite books to read. Mount. Hey. <sighs> Come on. Come on, Stitch. I just want my book back. Tell me a story about Fantasyland first. A story about Fantasyland, that one of these events reminded me of. Oh yeah! How about the story of the Alice in Wonderland attraction? The versions that were never built, the terrifying one that was, and how it evolved over the years. I'm listening. Our story begins in 1951 with Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland. The movie was based on the book Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but unlike Disney's previous adaptations, Alice had the unusual distinction of being one of the least profitable and praised from critics. So it might come as a surprise that from the very beginning of Disneyland's conception, it was envisioned as one of the main attractions of Fantasyland. However, unlike Peter Pan and Snow White, this would not be a dark ride but instead a walkthrough attraction, and would take visitors through set pieces inspired by the movie and its characters. We cross the moat through Sleeping Beauty's castle into the world of imagination. Once here, we can fly with Peter Pan to Neverland, wander with Alice through Wonderland, because in this land, Hopes and dreams are all that matter. In the very first conceptual rendering of Disneyland, it appears the original intention was to begin the experience by entering a rabbit hole. The walkthrough itself would have most likely begun just like Alice's journey begins in the film. You'd enter an oversized room, or forced perspective room as it's listed in the document, with a concealed exit at the far end and other doors leading to nowhere. Next was a room called Over the Waves and would feature backdrops that would go up and down as you walked along the ascending platforms. This would feature both a shrunken Alice in a glass vial, as well as a dodo sailing the waters. Then you entered a scene known as Dodo Rock, but you had to walk along a revolving platform, which of course tied to the scene from the movie. After this was an encounter with Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and according to the description were suspended figures from the ceiling that would turn and bump into each other. This led to a room that would change from day to night, with wobbly steps leading to the fish dinners, though whether you could go inside is unclear. But it's another great example of just how close they were trying to replicate very specific scenes from the movie. Next was the White Rabbit's house, and once inside, crazy stairs led to a slide that took visitors back outside. But it wasn't just for kids, as a look inside the house shows what appears to be a child's father going up the stairs to the slide. From here visitors entered the Garden with the Singing Flowers, where they encountered the Caterpillar, who would rise accordion-like with possible smoke rings from the hookah. After traveling through a set piece of giant trees in the Tolji Wood, you came face to face with the Cheshire Cat, who would disappear and reappear, just like in the movie. This led to the Mad Tea Party as one of the more elaborate scenes filled with animated figures, though obviously the movement would have been pretty basic given technology at the time. After this was a hedge maze where visitors could peek through bushes to see the card soldiers painting the roses red. Next was another maze through giant playing cards where visitors would eventually pass by the Queen's Court. The final section of the walkthrough was a trip through some rotating barrels to make visitors feel like they were tumbling through the playing cards. The story of Alice and her fabulous adventures in wonderful Wonderland. Coming to you next week from Disneyland. The Alice in Wonderland walkthrough would see quite a few scene and layout changes from the original concept, but the narrative remained mostly intact and overall the experience was to last about 6 minutes. However, at some point in Disneyland's revision process, the Alice in Wonderland walkthrough was completely abandoned and reimagined as a dark ride. The original design of the ride vehicles were to be giant playing cards, but Walt Disney felt a caterpillar was a much better choice. The outside would have been pretty incredible and a major departure from the castle courtyard slash medieval fair exteriors of the other attractions in Fantasyland. As far as the ride itself, it would abandon many of the concepts present in the walkthrough, more than likely due to the park's budget. 
However, speaking of the park's budget, ultimately it was decided to put Alice in Wonderland on hold, and its future would depend entirely on Disneyland's success. The location set aside for Alice would become the much more affordable Fantasyland Theater, and it seems a mini land known as Anything Can Happen Land was tossed around as a potential replacement. But Alice would still have a presence in the park in the form of a spinning teacups attraction. The original design was pretty elaborate with a Mad Tea Party centerpiece, and while the end result was more subtle, it still delighted visitors when the park opened in 1955. Uh, before we go, we'd like to bring you a preview presentation of some of the scenes from our next week's show. From Fantasyland, we will bring you our television version of the Lewis Carroll's classic, Alice in Wonderland. The delay of the attraction was probably for the best, as several years after its theatrical release, Disney cut together an hour-long version to include in Walt Disney's TV show. For whatever reason, this time audiences fell in love with the film, despite having been shortened, and would continue to air on television, thus growing its fanbase. And with the monumental success of Disneyland, it wasn't long before work resumed on the Alice in Wonderland dark ride. Construction officially began sometime around late 1957 to early 1958, and due to space limitations would be the first and only two-story dark ride, at least as far as Fantasyland. And though perhaps not as much as the other attractions, there was a decent amount of publicity leading up to Alice in Wonderland, and on June 14, 1958, the ride was officially open. While the original design of the European countryside changed dramatically, it was still a very unique sight compared to the other dark rides. And just to clear up a common myth, even before it was officially open to the public, the giant mushroom that served as the ticket booth did not have a caterpillar smoking a hookah, and has always been a large open book with Alice on the cover. This would actually be the only visual appearance of the character within the entire attraction, as initially all the dark rides in Fantasyland had visitors taking on the role of the protagonist. This is why Peter Pan, Snow White, and Mr. Toad only appear on the ride's mural, much to the complaint of visitors for nearly three decades. Once on board your Caterpillar ride vehicle, the journey began after entering a show building through what appeared to be a large rabbit hole, through a cross door and into a pitch black chamber. Surrounded in complete darkness, you'd hear the voice of Alice, which was actually recorded specifically for the ride by the original actress, and unlike the other dark rides, you'd hear her voice throughout the entire experience. You'd find yourself in the White Rabbit's house, or as Alice would say, the next thing I knew I was in the upside down room, which began with visitors traveling toward a mirror which made them appear as if upside down. Some of the decorations may look three dimensional, but this was thanks to the power of black lighting as they were all plywood flats. Suddenly, from the top of the doorway, the white rabbit appeared, loudly blowing his horn, and you then came to a pair of crash doors disguised as wallpaper leading to the next room. Alice would say, I kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, as you found yourself in the oversized room, and thus began the rather nightmarish aspect of the ride. <sighs> you may have noticed that I'm not all there myself. <laughs> You'd hear the Cheshire Cat laugh maniacally over and over as he appeared on top of a footstool. If that wasn't creepy enough, once you passed under him, his head would suddenly pop down from above, continuing his frightening laughter. This led to the doorknob from the film, but supposedly his mouth was stretched wide open and was a very unappealing sight. You were now in the flower room, or Garden of the Live Flowers, which sang all in the golden afternoon. As the vehicles ascended to the second floor, you might have thought this was a peaceful section of the ride. But once you reached the top, a terrifying dandelion sprung from the floor with a terrifying roar. This led to Tolji Wood, which continued the trend of turning an animated film for kids into a living nightmare, and was virtually pitch black as glowing red eyes pierced through the darkness. A break from the horror came with the appearance of familiar bird characters from the movie, However, the look on this little girl's face alludes to the still not being the fun adventures in Wonderland visitors had been promised. The nightmare continued with the Cheshire Cat singing an a cappella version of Twas Brillig. Soon you came to a sign with the words Mad Hatter, and despite Alice's commentary of suddenly I was on the table at the stupidest tea party I've ever been to, you were actually in for a pretty terrifying scene. It's very rude to sit down without being invited. I'll say it's rude. 
It's very, very rude indeed. As the unbirthday song played, giant teacups, saucers, and teapots spun around and appeared to nearly collide with your vehicle. Up ahead was a terrifying sight of a very angry Mad Hatter and March Hare. As you reached the characters, they'd suddenly pop up from the ground and tower over you, shouting, Very, very rude, or move down, move down. As you turn the corner, the Dormouse would pop out of a teapot as you appeared to crash into another giant teapot. Suddenly there was an explosion, with strobe lights simulating fireworks. Alice would scream, Oh dear, how do I get out? Oh, I've lost my way, as signs pointed in every direction. Then you suddenly and loudly crashed into a door, and then another door, and another door, and with each crash was the voice of Goofy, screaming at various terrifying pitches. <coughs> if you think I'm making this up, I'm not. Thankfully, with one final crash, the nightmare was over, as you found yourself outside and your vehicle wound its way down and back to the loading platform. <laughs> Alice in Nightmare Land and Mean Wonderland never quite reached the popularity of the other dark rides, and most visitors found the experience pretty underwhelming. The attraction really suffered from excluding so many characters and scenes from the animated film, all of which were present in the walkthrough version. Even the Queen's Courtyard, which appeared in later revisions of the Dark Ride's concept, was cut from the final attraction. Eventually sometime in the 60s, most of the terrifying characters were redesigned. Although pretty innocent, the White Rabbit was made to appear a little more appealing. The Cheshire Cat was made far less terrifying, and closer matched his appearance in the movie. Supposedly, the dandelion was also given a more cuddly appearance to match his character on screen. The more drastic change was the March Hare and Mad Hatter, as the entire scene was reworked from its nightmarish original version. They no longer popped up, screaming at innocent families, but appeared to happily pour tea from a teapot, and the Dormouse was made to look less traumatized. Alice in Wonderland it's like a trip to the looking class aboard a colorful caterpillar as you travel from place to place. Then you slide down a path made by huge vines. Much like the other original attractions of Fantasyland, by the 1980s they were becoming incredibly outdated, so Disney gave the entire land a makeover with new Fantasyland. Attractions such as Mr. Toad and Snow White were completely gutted, and Peter Pan saw the entire loading platform and queue demolished. However, an exception was Alice in Wonderland, as the track design and exterior was left mostly unchanged. I say mostly because the ride was given a brand new finale, which utilized a portion of Mr. Toad's show building. For New Fantasyland, the Mad Tea Party was also relocated and given a makeover, and would be closer to the dark ride to create more synergy between the two experiences. The new Alice in Wonderland would receive updates to scenes already present, along with a few new scenes that were cut from the walkthrough and initially planned version of the dark ride. But while New Fantasyland officially opened in 1983, visitors would have to wait another year for Alice in Wonderland. Oh, looking for the white rabbit? <laughs> Oh, see for yourself. When the attraction reopened in 1994, by this point Disneyland's ticket system had been abandoned, but Alice's ticket booth was left as a tribute. This may have something to do with the whole caterpillar smoking a hookah myth, as the top of the mushroom now featured six tiny pairs of shoes. Since both the upside down and oversized rooms were completely removed, the doorknob was moved to the end of the initial descent. Your first encounter was with Tweedledee and Tweedledum as you chased after the white rabbit. This led to the Garden of the Life Flowers, which saw the least amount of changes from the original version of the ride. The exception was the appearance of the smoking caterpillar from the walkthrough, along with an appearance by Alice herself. The Roaring Lion was also carried over, though much less terrifying. Tolji Wood was also pretty similar to the original version, although much less frightening, and this now featured an appearance by an also less terrifying Cheshire Cat. Instead of leading to the tea party, this became the hedge maze in Queen's Courtyard, from both the walkthrough and unbuilt version, ending with the Queen very upset. As a tribute to the original lineup of Crash Doors, these were now the card soldiers who fell to the side as you passed by, and even included one of the Goofy screams. Oh, oh, oh! Previously, this is where you began your descent to the unloading platform, but since the Queen's Courtyard replaced the original tea party, you took a slight detour to a new finale. Still traveling down, you had another encounter with the Cheshire Cat, which led to the new mad tea party scene and a less intense explosion. 
this new version of Alice in Wonderland was met with high praise and was seen as a major improvement over the original in almost every way possible. It's also worth mentioning that in 1992, Disneyland's initially planned walkthrough version was finally realized in Disneyland Paris. Sort of. Obviously nowhere near as elaborate as the 1953 concept, the maze did feature a number of scenes directly taken from the abandoned walkthrough. Back over at Disneyland, this version of Alice in Wonderland went virtually unchanged for nearly 30 years. That was until July of 2010, when the attraction was closed without notice. Evidently, California's Department of Occupational Safety and Health had an issue with the lack of safety rails on the second floor, and the width of the track itself. The ride was reopened a few months later, with what was supposed to be a temporary fix, as it was pretty hard on the eyes. Then one year passed, and another, and another. But thankfully in 2014, Disney announced the entire attraction would receive an overhaul. That July, a new and much improved exterior opened to the public, and the ride had quite a few changes on the inside as well, as new digital effects were added all throughout the entire experience. These truly brought the ride to life with subtle yet creative enhancements, and in my opinion are the best of the Fantasyland digital updates. It's a great example of taking a beloved attraction and making it even more of an immersive experience, without going overboard with technology and respecting the original. What makes this even more important is that Alice in Wonderland continues to be the only Fantasyland dark ride that hasn't been duplicated at the other Disney parks. So much like Peter Pan allows you to explore the world created by J.M. Barry, Snow White into the dark tale by the Brothers Grimm, Alice in Wonderland takes visitors into the beloved story by Lewis Carroll, and knock on wood, won't be going anywhere anytime soon. That being said, with Audible, you can dive into these stories right now and immerse yourself into the classic tales that inspired your favorite Disney films. Shameless plug aside, personally, I'm really, really enjoying Becoming Dr. Seuss by Brian J. Jones. He's one of my favorite authors, and his Jim Henson and George Lucas biographies were incredible listens. One of my favorite things about Audible is that I can enjoy these titles driving to the parks, walking our dog Frodo, or just taking a break from editing Yesterworld episodes. Each month, you receive credits for one audiobook and two Audible originals, and honestly, their selection of titles is absolutely incredible. Also, your credits roll over every month, and you get to keep your audiobooks even if you cancel. Just go to audible.com slash yesterworld, or text yesterworld to 500-500 to begin your free 30-day trial, and also receive your first audiobook and two Audible originals for absolutely free. So check out the description below and sign up today. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and if you haven't already, check out the Yesterworld podcast with the link in the description below, and we'll see you next time on Yesterworld.